Well, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker, and you've heard it said many times that when you, there are some people, when you introduce them, that they need no introduction. And our speaker this morning, the one who's coming to bring the Word of God to us today, needs no introduction. Uh, he's our former pastor, Kevin Donahoe. And uh, back in the day when he was here pastoring, we used to, I used to follow him every Sunday morning down the sidewalk over to the church building. And there's this place in the sidewalk that always floods. There's always water there that crosses that sidewalk at about two or three inches. And I would follow Kevin and Sometimes he would step in that water and it would part and he'd walk right on dry ground <laughs> through there. Other times he just walked right across the surface of the water. My feet always got wet. I'm joking with you, but the truth is, is that following uh, Kevin's leadership was a, was a real blessing in my life as it was for many of you here in the church. I know that as we've... Uh, followed him we always were assured that he was following Jesus and so it's a blessing to get to welcome him back home to speak to us the word of God today would you please welcome Pastor Kevin Donahoe good morning I thought he was going to say that uh See, what I remember, I remember when there'd be that water there, and I would run and hurdle the water, <laughs> but I don't remember ever doing that. So um, anyway, hey, it's, it's great to be with you uh, this morning, and um, although I, I was sitting down here thinking, <laughs> what have I done? And uh, like, if there was ever a time to re-enter, I'm not sure this was it. And, uh, but I will tell you, Wednesday morning, you know, it was actually last week, that I was, I was preparing. You know, this, is the, this is the weekend I always come to Salem. Uh, July 5th, 2002 is when my brother passed away. And so I always come home and be with my sister and my, my family. Um, and, and last week, I, I thought, I wonder, I mean, I just know, I, I knew that you've been trying to find people to fill uh, and preach. And I thought, I mean, I, I could, you know, maybe I should call. And then... Uh, and then Wednesday morning, I woke up about 6 a.m., which uh, is earlier than normal for me. And, and the Lord just had something on my heart, and it was a message that I preached several weeks ago. And, and I watch what happens here. I'm your biggest cheerleader. And uh, I, I, I cheer for this church and uh, for what God is doing here. And, and knowing what was taking place, I just, God had put a message on my heart. So I texted Mark. I think I probably woke you up too, didn't I? And uh, text, texted Mark and just said, hey, if, if you would need me, I would be willing and, uh, but I texted soon after that said, I really don't have to, and I'm okay if I don't, <laughs> but I'm here today. And so, uh, but I also, I, I, I recognize that in my entering today, I, man, I'm not coming to like, uh, this isn't about me, and it's not about re-entering. Um, I recognize I walk into a very sensitive place, and I, I feel that this morning. And, and I know there's a lot of hurting people um, I recognize even next service from what I hear, there are probably a lot of hurting kids here. And, uh, and I'm a little nervous about that because uh, one of the things I told Rachel, I said, maybe they need an insider to speak this week. Like maybe Mark should do it or someone else. And I thought, I, I wonder if I'm still an insider. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, and yet at, at, at the same token, I'm just going to trust and believe and even just pray during that last song that the words that I have for you today, that the Lord has for you today, they'll be the right words. He's going to find a way to connect them to your heart in a way which will be meaningful and it won't be from Kevin. We'll, we'll, we'll be from dec directly from him. Can we trust that this morning? Yes. Before we go any further, uh, I just want to take an opportunity and I'm going to pray for us. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this humble opportunity to stand in front of this group of people and to share. And Lord, what I'm trusting is that you're going to be whispering in my ear for the next 20 minutes and, and, and that, Lord, the things that need to be cut out will be cut out and the things that need to be added will be added. But at the end of the day, Lord, we'll have heard from you. Lord, I know that we have uh, people in this community that they desperately need to hear from you. I pray that you would be drawing people to you in the midst of their brokenness, that healing may begin. And God, as Cheryl said, we, we will move forward. People will move forward. 
Lord, what I hope, and I, I just hope for their sake, from my experience, that they'll move forward walking with you, that you may be the one who begins to put people back together again. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, so a few weeks ago, I, I, I was preaching a series at, at the church that I pastor up in Ottawa, and it's, it's called God Is. And I've been reading a book, um, it's called The Good and Beautiful God by James Bryan Smith. It's a, it's a great book, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's different things, like we've preached on God is good, we've preached on God is trustworthy, God is generous. Um, one of my associates today is preaching on God is love, and then next week I'll be preaching on God is holy. And, and as I laid in bed on Wednesday morning, I thought about the God is good sermon, that may seem like a weird sermon to preach today because you may be going, Kevin, I don't know that anybody's going to really feel like God is good today, but I just want to assure you that he is. Man, he is good. And, and just because things are a mess and just because, you know, this community, there's been all kinds of tragedy, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned the place. It doesn't mean that he's left. But God is good. I remember growing up here in this church, growing up under Pastor Ice, and many of you may remember this, that every once in a while, uh, he, he would stand up and he would say, God is good. And what would the people say? And he'd say, all the time. Yeah, that kind of sounded like him, didn't it? A little gravelly. I remember that as a kid. And uh, it was just kind of like, it was just part of him. It was part of what he did. But you know, um, for many of us, like as a kid, that was so easy to say, it just kind of rolled off our tongues, like, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. It was, it was just easy. But we know as we get older, as we graduate from Sunday school classes, that there's places along the road where the whole theory of God is good gets tested. All of us. There's some time where the rubber meets the road and we say, do I really believe that, that God is good all the time and all the time God is good? Or do we just say it, Right? On July 5th, 2002, that was probably the first time in my life in, in, in this real kind of way that the whole statement of God is good was tested for me. It was tested not for a week or a month. It was tested for years. Is God really good? You know, one of the challenges in that was that I was still a pastor. And I had to stand in front of people and pretend that he was good. When in my heart, I had doubts and I had wonders. You know, sometimes it's in these kinds of places, it's like the hardest place to be honest about really what we feel. That we show up, we try to sing songs, we try to pretend that he's good, and yet in our deep, deep down in the recesses of our heart, we say, oh, I'm not really sure. Well, I want to assure you this morning, God is more interested in your honesty than just you're mumbling of words, and you're going through routines. And God is big enough that he can handle anything that you're feeling or anything that you're thinking. In fact, I think he values that. He values that his children would come to him and say, man, this is where I am. Yeah, you know, I remember um, going through the funeral and going through the visitation right here at this place. And the lines wound through, and man, people would come through, and it's been happening here lately, Right? And people would say all kinds of things. In fact, I remember some of the phrases that people would say. I mean, I don't remember the people. I just remember, you know, the masses. But things that people would say. I remember people saying, God needed him more than we did. I remember the phrase of God needed an angel in heaven. And I got to tell you, I hated those phrases. In fact, I, I would just, I would, I would challenge you to be really careful what you say in the upcoming weeks to people. Because see, the things that you say, they give a picture of the God that you follow. The things that we say, sometimes they develop a picture in people. And I remember hearing those, those phrases, and I could still hear them. And see, I can tell you from our family's perspective, God didn't need my brother more than we did. I was confident of that. From Zach and Carissa's perspective, God didn't need my brother more than we... He didn't need another angel in heaven. I don't believe that. See, and those kinds of statements, you can tell. I mean, they got deep on me. 
I carried them for a long time, and I wrestled with them. Because, see, if those statements were true, then God was like, he was different than what I thought he was. The picture that I walked away with wasn't the God that I had when I was little. See, I just don't believe that God is some sick and twisted character playing games with us. I mean, we know that people struggle with with bad things that happen in the world that we live in and seeing God as good. I mean, all kinds of people struggle with that. But I just don't believe that's that he's this God who just plays with us. See, many people hold a view that, and they've held this for years and years, and it's kind of summed up as follows. That God is this angry judge, and if you do good things, you'll be blessed. And if you sin, you'll be punished. And I think it plays out something like this. You know, we show up at church, and we put something in the offering plate, or we do a service project, or we go over and we mow our neighbor's yard, and all of a sudden, I mean, look out, because here comes the blessings, right? I mean, they're coming. Just count on it. Open your hands. Man, you do good things. It's coming. On the other hand, you skip church to play golf. Keep your eyes open, and don't hold your club too high, because lightning just might strike, Right? That's kind of how we think. That's how a lot of folks think. So we have to be careful of the stories that we speak of. I I remember shortly after the tragedy of 9-11, there were two popular Christian televangelists that proclaimed that God was punishing the United States, and New York in particular, for its sinfulness. That God had inspired a group of terrorists on his behalf to ply planes into a building for him. Do do, do you remember that? It's a terrible story. Or I remember it, the number of school shootings there's been across the last years. And oftentimes what you hear around the church is that's a result. I mean, that's a direct result that God is angry that we took prayer out of schools. Really? I mean, listen to the stories that we sometimes share. They're messed up. And then we wonder why the world looks at our God and says, I don't think I want anything to do with that. If that's the way he is and that's how you speak of him, I don't think I want any part of that. There was a lady that walked into my office just this last week. In the last couple months, she lost her son. Her son was probably mid-40s. He died instantly. No forewarning. And as she walked in my office, I could hear the pain in her heart this week. And she sat down, and she was actually there to see someone else, and I ran into her, and I just wanted to have a conversation with her. asked her how she was doing. And she said, you know, when you preach this message of God is good, she said, man, I so resonate with that. She said, in fact, there's been some people in my life who are just making some statements. And she said, and and you have to recognize, this is a a little, like, she's kind of frail and she's a senior lady. And she looked at me and she said, I just want to punch them. (laughs) I said, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't punch them. But I understand where you're coming from. In fact, um, I, I could hear it pain in her heart. There's a story in the Bible that talks about God punishing bad people. Jesus was asked about this on two different occasions. The the first came when when he was asked to explain two horrific events, one caused by human cruelty and one caused by a a natural disaster. We're going to look at it. It's Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. It says, now there, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Are those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Did they suffer because they were worse sinners? Did you hear that? And Jesus says, no. No. He he uses this tragedy not to explain how God punishes people, but to remind them that life goes beyond our death, whatever that looks like here. There's another story in the Bible that talks about a man blind from birth. And his disciples had had questions about this, so they asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, listen to these words, 
Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I did a funeral about a month ago of a lady who'd been battled, battling cancer for about two years. She was a school teacher in a neighboring community, and it was, it was a huge, huge community event. And, and I remember showing up at the house the morning that she passed away. And I walked in, and her husband led me back to the bedroom where, where she still lay. And, and, you know, those are always, like, those are always very tense um, careful kinds of places. I'm very careful. I'm careful of what I say, careful of how I enter. We enter very humbly, and, and we recognize, I mean, we're there not for really what we say. As a pastor, you're there for your presence. You're there to extend a hug, to wrap your arm around somebody. As I walked in, you know what he told me? He, he stood there at the bed, and he said, uh, God didn't take her. God didn't give her cancer. Cancer didn't win. And and I just kind of I looked at him and I could tell he had a he had a story to tell. And as he began to tell this story, he said, Many people think that I didn't get my prayers answered. But we did. Just not in the way that we thought. He said it was so obvious that God's presence walked with us the entire journey over the last two years. Like he interceded over and over and over. We, we experienced his presence. And yes, he didn't heal her here. But he still answered our prayers. As I listened, as I listened to Jeff talk, I could tell, and I told him, I said, man... God has shared some perspective with you. Because oftentimes when I stand in these kinds of places, this is not the perspective that I hear. This is not the way people see things. He has shared perspective with you. See, I think it's really hard for us to grasp, isn't it? It's hard for us in those kinds of places to see from God's perspective. I think it's really hard for us to grasp that sunshine and rain are given equally. For many people, the struggle of faith is not believing what God promises after life. It's believing in God's activity in the midst of life. Hear that. It's not the fact that I mean, people can't swallow, okay, God can do this after life. It's the fact that people struggle with if God is really real, what in the world is going on in the midst of life? Matthew chapter 5 says that you may be children of your Father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. When we don't believe this and we buy in to the righteous should never see the rain, when something goes wrong, we struggle to make sense of it and our view of God takes the hit. You know as well as I do. I'm sorry to say terrible things happen to wonderful people. They do. Terrible things happen to wonderful people. And on the flip side, I mean, we don't like to talk about it, but wonderful things happen to awful people. And there's times when we're looking at it saying, man, if I was God, I would do things so much differently, right? I would do it so much differently. I mean, how can a person face tragedy and still see that God is good? You know, I think one thing we have to get a wrap our heads around is we have to expect hardship. We weren't promised some, some card that gets us out of it. We weren't promised a card that says, man, you get to go around the line and you get to go first. That's not what we were promised. We should expect heartache, we should expect pain, and we should expect suffering, and we should expect loss because it's what it means to be human. The only, the only consolation is, is that God uses it in our development. That God uses it to shape who we are. John 16 says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Because in this world, he says it real clearly, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. See, our hope comes, you know this, I know this. 
But I think this is the time in which we just need to be reminded and we need to hear his words. Because if we believe his words to be true and we believe them, like we believe them, we've got to hear them over and over. This is a great time to be in the word and be reminded of who he is. Because John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. See, my hope on July 5th, every single year, my hope is I know where my brother resides. And the other thing I know is I know where I'm walking towards my, my destination. And that there will come a time, I don't know, will it be this year or will it be 40 years from now? I don't know. But there will come a time when we get to be united again. And even here's what I know, that in the meantime, that in the meantime I'm thankful for my relationship with Jesus because he continues to walk with me even when I'm hurting. And he's walked with me since 2002 and helped me to process a lot of different things. He's helped me. He's comforted me. And what I trust is that there's going to come a day where that will feel less, maybe from a distance. And all of a sudden that Jesus and I will be face to face. Now, I got to tell you, even in the midst of that, if, if you think I'm standing up here and I don't have questions for Jesus, you are wrong. And when Jesus and I get face to face, he needs a whole afternoon because we're going to talk, right? You ever feel like that? I want to ask him questions. I want to know why. I want to know what was behind it. I want to know what came out of it. The things that I couldn't see, the things that are beyond our sight, what were those things? See, I, I believe this, that our growth, it comes in claiming God's goodness along the way. Our, our growth comes in claiming his goodness along the way. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. God, give us perspective. I believe in my heart that you are good. But Lord, help us. Help us to see your goodness in spite of the messed up world that we live in. See, our view of God, it comes through our view of Jesus. You know, one of the things, this book that I told you I've been reading in this perspective, it's this idea that oftentimes the, the, world, the world can, if, if we're not careful, we, we live in a world where we hear all kinds of stories. We hear all kinds of narratives. And what we do is sometimes we take these stories that we hear and then we lay them on our relationship with God. We don't always check them with Scripture. We don't always, because sometimes Scripture is not the loudest voice in our life. People are the loudest voice in our life. The world is the loudest voice in our life. And one of the things this book is talking about, if you really want to know about the Father, if you want to know who He is, then what you've got to do is you've got to get in touch with Jesus. And you've got to look at His words about who He says that the Father is. See, that's crucial. I remember when I was, it was probably the first year or two, it was, in the first, it was within, the, within the first two years of, of my brother passing, and I was serving at College Church of the Nazarene up in Bourbonnet, Illinois. And I had a wonderful pastor. His name was Dan Boone. He's now the president of Trevec Trevecca Nazarene University. And that man, like, he, he was amazing, absolutely amazing. I mean, if I, I, I could listen to him preach over and over and over and over. And, and I love to read his books, and I love to read his, anything he writes, because when he speaks, like, there's, there's just... <laughs> Like, he's right on it. And I remember a sermon that he preached, and my wife and I were talking about it about a month ago, that he stood up and he was talking about this whole idea of, of God being good. Years ago, I remember in the midst of my pain, hearing that sermon, and one of the things he talks about is that what it feels like at times, I'm guessing in this community, to many people, what it feels like at times is that God has picked Salem, Illinois, and he waves his scepter and says, you know what, right now, how about some havoc over there? Or how about right now? 
whom havoc over there. It, it feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like at times like you're getting picked on. It feels like at times like, man, he could have, why couldn't he have waved that somewhere different? Why did he have to wave it here? Why did he have to wave it over this family? It would have made a whole lot more sense over that family, right? But see, what he said is, he says, you know, that's not a picture of our God. Pastor Boone said, I don't, I don't picture God with a scepter. See, Jesus gives us this great picture of who our Father is. It's this picture of a God who reaches down from heaven, who reaches down in the midst of our pain, and he stretches out his hand. And when he stretches out his hand, what you'll notice is there's a hole right in the middle of it. I'll never forget it. When he held out his hand, he looked over the congregation, and he said, are you hurting today? Do you need healing do you need to know he's good? Because God reaches right down in the midst of your pain and he says, I know what it means to hurt. I know what it means to be wounded. I know what it means to feel pain in the world that you live in. And I came, I came to extend my hand to you out of love. Love before you ever loved me to say, I know what it's like and I gave up my life for you. And if you'll allow me to, this is not about me waving a scepter. This is about me waving a hand and saying, I will walk with you in the midst of your pain. I will never forget it. It was one of the places in which God began to do some healing in here. It was one of those places in which my, the story that I believed about God began to change and began to turn. I recognize we live in a world that's messed up, and I recognize, even for many of us, we don't know what's going to happen this week. None of us have, like, this, you know, card that says, hey, man, good news. I've done some really good things for Jesus, so I get the next 30 years. None of us. But the promise that was made so clear to us is he would say, man, if you'll walk with me, I will walk with you through whatever, whatever this world has to offer in the midst of what it is. You will never walk alone. You will never walk alone. See, the truth is you will move forward. This community will move forward. The question is, will you do it with his hand? Or will you do it walking away saying, I don't want anything to do with your hand? And I can tell you this, the road to healing, the road to healing is not walking away. The road to healing is embracing the one who suffered and saying, I need to be close to one who suffered and one who understands. You know, one of the things I remember as a grieving person, I remember is I wanted to be close to people who were grieving as well. I wanted to be close to people who felt the pain, who understood it. See, that's what Jesus offers us. He offers us this relationship with one who understands. Can I pray with us today? Father, thank you. I thank you for who you are. God, oftentimes we, we hear the wrong things and, and we get these wrong stories concocted in our heads. And yet, God, I pray that your scripture, that it, as we read about you and we read about your love for us, we read about what you've done for us, that God, you would set that straight, that you would rewrite those stories in our hearts and that we would know who you are. God, this community, they need you more than ever. They need to know your wounded hand. They need to know that you have the power to heal. And they need to know that more than anything, you want to walk with the hurting. May they know it today. And may they not turn from you, but may they turn towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. two options. You turn away or you turn towards. I had the opportunity to do a destination wedding. It was, it was within the last month. And uh, fortunately, that destination was in Mexico. You know, that was one of those deals when the couple asked me, I wanted to give it to an associate, but I thought, ah, I think I'll take this one, right? So I went to Mexico for about three days and and, and it was one of those places where, um, you know, the couple, just, they told us where to go, and they set it all up, and we went. And, and, and it was this place where it was basically all you could eat all the time. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those places. But, I mean, 
I mean, you just, you just say, I want more food, you know? Just hang out at the food place all day long. When I got home, I was actually leaning on the back of the couch, and my son looked at me and said, Dad, you look chubbier. <laughs> there was a reason. Do you know, I went to the buffet, and this buffet, it was huge. Like, it was almost overwhelming. You know, it took a while. Like, food was cold by the time I got back, because you're still circling, you know, what you started on the plate with. And, and, I, and I tried some things that I would never try. I mean, I would never order it. But because it's free, and because I could like, hey, if I don't like it, I'm going to go back and get some more, I was trying all kinds of things. I learned that actually I like more things than I thought I did. Amazing? I found out that many things that didn't look good were actually good. Psalm 34, 8, it says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's say it again. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I noticed on social media, Trent um, tweeted something this week. and It says, our community needs Jesus like never before. He is the answer. Give him a try. I can make an introduction. I want to tell you something. I know this, that in the midst of a community that's broken, in the midst of people that are broken, that's exactly where you will find Jesus. Jesus is drawn towards the hurting. He wants to help you heal. He wants to walk with you. He wants to hurt with you. If we play this song, as Jeremy leads us, I want to give you an opportunity to move towards him. My prayer is, is, is I, when I got the news that I was preaching, my prayer for this, for this weekend was that God, in the midst of pain, that he would just draw people to him. I mean, maybe people who would say, you know what? I realize I need him more than ever, and I want to start a relationship with him today. Can I tell you? It's not hard to do. It's not some special prayer. It's just, man, it's sticking your, like, looking up towards heaven and saying, God, I need you. Forgive me. I believe in you, and I want to start walking with you. But maybe there's people who would just say, when we sing this song, I'm going to get a couple options. You can come to an altar. You can pray. You can, you can sit in your seat. You can sing. You can pray. Or you can stand up, and you can just proclaim from the top of your lungs that he is your cornerstone. He is your anchor. And, and you know what? That in the midst of... No matter what takes place in the midst of all the things that are happening in this community, that he is still good. And that he's still on the throne. That he's not waving a scepter, but that he's waving a hand. Would you respond today? As they play, respond how you feel appropriate.